This is the second in our further mechanics videos dealing with momentum. And we're going to be covering specification points 101 and 102 here. If you're doing IAL, that's 85 and 86, but the actual physics is the same. Where the first one is understanding how to determine whether a collision is elastic or inelastic. We don't need to know the definitions of those, um, though in order to determine them, you really do need to know what you're talking about, so we'll go through that. And then derive and use the equation connecting momentum to kinetic energy in a non-relativistic particle. This is just told to you so that you know you don't need to worry about if the particle gets up to the speed approaching the speed of light, we are going to have time dilation, and that's going to interfere with our calculations. We do not need to worry about that. Okay, so what's an elastic collision? When we talk about collisions here, we know that in collisions, that momentum is conserved. And so we're going to assume that for these collisions, and it is conserved provided no external forces act. So that's an assumption we're going to make. Within that momentum conservation, we have two types of collision, elastic and inelastic. And for an elastic collision, kinetic energy is also conserved. So that is simply what an elastic collision is. It's a collision in which kinetic energy is conserved. We are going to determine it with an example later on. We do have situations in which the collision is considered to be perfectly elastic. That is, each object that comes into the collision, M1 and M2 in this case, keeps its own kinetic energy. So it leaves the collision with the same amount of kinetic energy it had coming in. It's a specific type of elastic collision. An inelastic collision, therefore, is one in which EK is not conserved. This is going to be much more common because, as we know, very often you're going to get a transfer of energy from one store, kinetic energy, to another through work, like friction, um, through sound, ending up in thermal, usually ends up in thermal anyway. So in inelastic collision, your kinetic energy before is not equal to your kinetic energy after. There is, again, a specific type of inelastic collision that's called perfectly inelastic, and this would be where the two objects stick together and don't move after the collision. But again, this is a specific type of inelastic collision. Most inelastic collisions are not like this. In my previous video, and I'll put a link to the video here, you can see that we used this example. Uh, in which an alpha particle approached a stationary helium nucleus, and we use this to determine whether momentum was conserved in this collision. This time we're going to use the same thing to see if kinetic energy is conserved. Both particles have the same mass, so we're going to use that number for mass, and then the kinetic energy before is going to be just the kinetic energy of the alpha particle. Kinetic energy after, we have to determine from both the alpha and the helium. The good news is, is that energy is not a vector, so we do not need to do the horizontal and vertical components of the velocity and find the horizontal and vertical components of the energy. Energy doesn't have horizontal and vertical components, so we just use the total velocity as given here. Now what you can do is use half mv squared to calculate the kinetic energy of the alpha before, the kinetic energy of the alpha after, and the kinetic energy of the helium nucleus after and see if they're the same. I'm going to do the calculation, but you can pause the video, do the calculation yourself, I'll speed up my calculations, and then check your answer afterwards. Okay, now that we've done the calculations, let's check the before and after. We have 7.48 times 10 to the minus 13 before and 7.49 times 10 to the minus 13 after. Because, of course, we've done some rounding in our calculations, the last significant figure, if there's a small difference between them, we can let that go, and therefore we can say this is an elastic collision because the kinetic energy before is equal to the kinetic energy after. One point to note is, and examiners often comment on this, a lot of students will write down the square in when they're showing their work in their calculation and then forget to square it when it comes to using their calculator. So make sure that you double check that you squared everything, especially if you have a collision like this which involves particles and you don't get the kinetic energy being the same before and after. 
think to yourself, hmm, let me just double check that I've done all my swearing. An interesting aside about this is in any elastic, there are some conditions that go with it, in any elastic example where the objects have the same mass and it's a head-on collision, you are always going to get the angles of the resulting vectors adding up to 90 degrees. And it's nice to be able to prove why that is. So we're going to use our equations for momentum and kinetic energy to prove that. So if we say, right, m1 vi, the momentum before, is equal to m2 vf1 plus m3 vf2. Now, we know that all the m's are the same. So we know that those are going to cancel out and that the initial velocity is equal to the sum of the final velocities. If we were to draw this as a vector diagram, we would say, all right, those are our final velocities there, vf1 and vf2, and that is our initial velocity. What we're trying to prove is that this not very well drawn angle is 90 degrees. And how are we going to do that? We are going to use our kinetic energy equations to do that. So if we say, okay, EKI, the initial kinetic energy, we know is equal to EK F1 plus EK F2. Because we've been told this is an elastic collision, we know that the kinetic energy is conserved. Now, if we substitute in for this, Again, we know all these masses are equal, so we can cancel out the masses, because that's one of the conditions for which this is true, and also, of course, we can can cancel out the halves. And so we're left with our equation being vi squared is equal to vf1 squared plus vf2 squared. That is the hypotenuse of our triangle. And this is the sum of the squares of the other two sides. And of course, as you know, that is Pythagoras' theorem. And Pythagoras' theorem applies to right angle triangles. Therefore, this triangle must be right angled. The second of our specification points here involves connecting the equations for momentum and kinetic energy and being able to derive a final equation that has both of them in it. So let's start with writing down our equations. The first step in this derivation is to square your momentum equation. So v squared is equal to m squared v squared. We are then going to solve this for v squared because we want to put it into the kinetic energy. So v squared is p squared divided by m squared. And then we're going to take that and we're going to put it in up here. That's going to give us ek equals half m on p squared over m squared. That m is going to cancel with the second one there, leaving us ek is a half p squared over m or as our specification says, p squared over 2m. That is the derivation. Taking a moment to look at slightly more advanced applications of momentum and force calculations. So sometimes what you get is the applications of rockets and jets. So if we look at the rocket here, we know that the engine exerts a force on the gases, it ejects the gases downwards, the gases exert an equal and opposite force on the engine, Upwards, that's Newton's third law, and the rocket obviously accelerates upwards because it's got a resulting force upwards. What you usually get given in examples like this, you get told things like, okay, so the gases are ejected at a speed of, let's say, 4,400 meters per second. And they are used up at, at or ejected at, again, a rate of 12,000 kilograms per second. What is the upward force on the rocket? And we're going to use our Newton's second law version of momentum for this, 
But the difference here is that we don't have a change in speed of those gases. So most of the calculations that we do involve objects whose speed changes and therefore their momentum changes. Here we have no speed change, we have a mass change instead. So if we look at our, moment, our force and momentum equation, it is that, as we know, and that's going to be delta mv over t. Here we have a delta m. We know it's 12,000 kilograms, and it's done in one second. So we can put 12,000 kilograms at the top and one second at the bottom, multiplied by our speed at which the gases are rejected, and we end up with a force of 5.3 times 10 to the 7 newtons. And so the rocket is going to get a consequent force of minus 5.3 times 10 to the 7 newtons. The second situation in which you encounter this kind of problem is the use of jets of water. Very nice in this example where it's being used on a protester. You can see that this is the hose up here and the jet of water reaches down here. What we want to know is what is the force on a person struck by the jet? This is a particular, if you're doing the whole May level, paper three is a synoptic paper plus practical synoptic questions involving questions taken, taking ideas from multiple parts of the syllabus and putting them together. And you have to be able to reach all of your knowledge and connect it. So that is what this is doing here. We're given the cross-sectional area of the hose pipe and therefore the jet of water, the velocity of the jet of water, and the density of the water. And we want the force that this jet of water exerts on the person. Okay, again, we look back at our momentum equation and we'll say f is equal to change in momentum over time. And that's the change in mass times velocity over time. So we need some way of getting, we know the velocity of the water, so that's okay. We need some way of getting the mass of the water that is ejected over time. We know that density is equal to mass over volume. So therefore, mass is equal to density times volume. Okay, so we could put that into our equation and say that would be the delta density times volume times V over T. Now we're getting closer because we do have the cross-sectional area of the jet. So we should be able to, if we knew the length of that jet, from hose pipe to person, as I've labeled in the diagram, if we knew the length of that, we could find the volume of that stream of jet. We do know the, know the length of it because we know that it moves at a velocity of 20 meters in one second. So if we were to take a one second version of this jet, then we know it's 20 meters long. So we can say volume is equal to area times the distance or volume over time, which is what we're after for our momentum equation, volume over time is area times distance over time, which of course we know is velocity. So therefore volume over time is going to be area times velocity. So now we go back to our momentum equation and we say, right, we can now substitute for V over T here area times velocity. So we're going to end up with density times area times velocity times velocity again, which is density area velocity squared. Now this is not an equation that is given to you in the data book. It is not an equation that you need to be able to know. But what is required at A-level and has come up a lot in, in previous papers, recent papers, you need to be able to derive additional equations that might be given to you, like this, from your knowledge across the specification. So this is just provides you with good practice in being able to connect all these things together. And oftentimes, another piece of advice is if you look at the units that you are given on quantities and let them guide you towards where you need to be, and they will give you a clue. So here we've got the seconds, that time factor that we need in that force equation, 
is attached to the velocity. And oftentimes, if you follow the units, it will give you a, a guide as to where to go with these problem solving. Now that we have our equation, let's just substitute our values from here in. So our force is going to be 1,000 kilograms meters, kilograms per meter cubed, times 2 times 10 to the minus 4 meters squared, because it has to be in meters squared. 1 centimeter is times 10 to the minus 2 meters, and therefore 1 centimeter squared is times 10 to the minus 4 meters squared, times our velocity squared, giving us a force of 80 newtons. That concludes the momentum section of our further mechanics. I'm going to do a couple of videos on the core practicals that go along with it and connect those into the practical skills that you need. You will find those in the channel uh, working as a physicist. And please do go along. I will label them core practical 9 and 10, which are the two core practicals that you need to be able to use in further mechanics for this section.